I have mentioned to you in the past on the day that I received this video called The Exodus Revealed. I took it home, put it in the VCR, and began to watch it and was thoroughly intrigued as I saw Dr. Leonard Moiler put a camera over the side of the boat on the Red Sea and that camera went down and began to take pictures of the remains of the chariots of Pharaoh at the Exodus crossing site. And I want you to know that today we have Dr. Moeller in our studio. We are so happy to have him come and be with us and talk to us about how he came to discover these things and to write the book. We have the book here also, The Exodus Case. He builds a case for the Exodus and then the video as well. Gary Stearman and I are going to be uh, interviewing him. Gary, this is an exciting day. But JR, it's a red letter day, and I want to welcome Dr. Leonard Muller to mm -hmm. Oklahoma City and to the studios of Prophecy in the News. It's nice to meet you. Mm -hmm. It's nice to be here. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Muller has such a story to tell, JR, uh, but I want us to begin today by get, uh, getting to know him. Uh, uh, introduce yourself to our audience. Tell us about the place you study, about the place mm -hmm. you work, your background, a little bit about uh, Dr. Leonard Muller. Yeah. The uh, first thing is that uh, I live in Sweden, and Sweden is far away from the U.S. And uh, just because Americans in general don't know this, Sweden is a rather big country in terms of the area. The population is about the same as in New York. But if you put Sweden over Europe, it will cover Denmark, Germany, Switzerland, to south of Rome. We are used to space in Sweden. Ah, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, Dr. Muller uh, works at the, the uh, Karolinska Institute, Stockholm, Sweden. Tell us about uh, what that yeah. place is for people who might not be familiar with it. Yeah, my occupation is really science. Uh, I'm a professor in medicine, and the Karolinska Institute is actually the university, the medical university of Stockholm. It's a big place. Uh, we have some 2,300 PhD students, and the size is probably of the medical school similar to Harvard here in the U.S. So how does a medical researcher write the Exodus case? Uh, there's, there's got to be a connection of some sort. Oh, but it's uh, in one way very, very simple. Because as a scientist, you just are exposed all the time to questions, unanswered questions. And you have to answer them, or you deal with them. And since I'm a Christian, I read my Bible and I see things and I get interested in them. So, I mean, it's not so far, far away to get interested in. Hmm. Now, you went to the, to the Gulf of Aqaba and uh, took a boat and uh, the equipment to go down and take pictures at the bottom, which we have seen here in this incredible video. And also in the book that you have uh, pictures of the chariot wheels and uh, your hypothesis is that that is the crossing site. Now, I would like to know how you first got in, interested in the idea of going there and uh, what drew you to this particular area. Mm. I first was in that area as early as 1973, being uh, a visiting scientist or attending a summer university in, in Israel. Um, I am interested in archaeology in general. I'm interested in nature. I collect uh, minerals, precious stones that I found out in nature. I pan for gold, these things. I am interested in nature in general. I travel a lot. I've been in some 60 countries. And when I go to a country, I just rent a car. I am by myself. And I go to places where people normally don't go to. I can't be on these charter trips. I can't. I, I don't fit yes. in there. So uh, reading the Bible, of course, everything in the Bible is related to the Middle East. Uh, and being in Israel, I've been looking at places of interest. But um, uh, I also found that there is a lot of people that don't consider the Old Testament to be of any relevance. And to me, it's an historical document. And yes. sometimes I just focus on something in the Old Testament. And I read a lot of things, and I make notes, and I put a structure, and I put up a number of questions, and then I wonder, how to deal with this? Did it really happen? Where was it? Etc. Mm -hmm. Etc. Et well, you know, years ago I took a, a boat trip down from Aqaba mm -hmm. down to the Nueva Peninsula and disembarked there. As I stood on the, the beautiful white sands of that eastern shore of the Gulf of Aqaba, I had no idea that I was standing at the crossing site. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, so what, what gave you the idea to, uh, to look beneath the waters on that eight mile crossing site uh, to find these things anyway? Well, to be honest, I don't think to look um, at the seabed there is the most critical part. Uh, to me, the most critical part is where is the land of median located? Mm -hmm. Because if we know where the land of median is located, then we must re relate all the other things to that. So to me, uh, the diving part of this is not the crucial part of it. It's an interesting part, but not the crucial part. Yes. Well, you know, Gary, they found, he, he found these, all these wheels. I'm looking at wheels here, <laughs> uh, axles, uh, the remains of the chariots, but you also found some bones down there. And I, I noticed right on the front cover here, uh, one of the uh, bones, and you asked the question, skeleton parts of Pharaoh's army? Um, tell us about finding the bones. Well, first, one must realize that diving at this place is a very strange experience. Uh, we have all seen these coral reefs on television, beautiful colors. I mean, you just enjoy seeing it. This yes. is like a graveyard. All the corals are dead. And it's not a reef, it's corals here and there on a kind of sandy seabed, just yes. standing up like tombstones around. And um, when we dive there, we look for different um, shapes, circular things, 90 degree angles, uh, and things like that. And um, we must remember that whatever took place here took place a very long time ago. And I yes. don't want to say that we can prove anything. But what I can say is that we can find a lot of things that are very strange, that you normally don't find when you dive, that has the appearance of wheels, uh, remains of chariots, human remains, remains from horses, cattle, and they are sometimes twisted into one another like this. Mm -hmm. And they are coralized. Corals have started to grow on these objects. And then the corals have died, and they have kept the shape of what's been growing on. And um, one thing that we found was a, a bone, uh, or the remains of a bone, a femur, the upper part of the leg. Um, and when I saw that, I immediately thought that this looks like a femur. So the way I approached it was that I took it to scientists uh, in osteology, dealing with skeleton science, and I didn't tell them anything. They didn't know me, and I didn't tell anything about the find, and I just said to them, well, what is this? And they started to look at it, and they measured it, and they had seven or eight different characters, and they said, this is most likely a human femur. It's not from a chimpanzee, it's not from a gorilla, and um, they could even give the, the body height of the person, which are then mm. compared to some mummies How about that? and so on. So um, I try to, when it's possible, to investigate it in a scientific manner. But it's not always possible to do that. Dr. Muller, <clears throat> I have a question for you. Uh, and the question has to do with Exodus 13, 18. But God led the people about <clears throat> through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. Now, we've all read Exodus, <clears throat> and we've read about the, the Wilderness March, and we've read about the Red Sea, and there's been a great deal of debate about what the Red Sea actually is. Let's talk about the Red Sea. Where is it? Well, there's a very simple answer to it. The Red Sea doesn't exist. Ah. Uh -huh. That's it. Okay. Now, we need to know more, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so the real name is Yam Suf? Well, um, uh, this is a long story, and there is a lot of things around it, but uh, Red Sea is not anything you find in the Bible. That's my statement. Okay. How do you know then that this Nueva Peninsula was the crossing site, and the waters there of what is called the Gulf of Aqaba today is the biblical sea? I don't know that that is the place, but the hypothesis is that the biblical text regarding these events is a true text in terms of historical events. And based on the history that you can follow in the biblical texts, it's my understanding that you end up there. And that's what I'm arguing for and discussing in the book. Mm -hmm. Now, I should point out at this uh, moment <clears throat> that Red Sea in English is Yom Suf, Yam Suf in, in the Hebrew. And, and Yam Suf uh, can be identified with a particular location. Is that oh, yes. correct? Oh, uh, yes. The Yam Suf can, uh, it's uh, found uh, many places in the Bible. 
But uh, if we first just mention what people normally think about Yamsuf, uh, they say it's the Red Sea or the Sea of uh, uh, the Reed Sea. That's the common understanding. Mm -hmm. JR, we're out of time for this segment, but we need to continue this discussion on yes. into our next segment because this is very critical to this study. Yeah. We are privileged to have the man who put the underwater camera down at the bottom of that Red Sea and took pictures of the chariot wheels. We'll be back in just a moment. Dr. Leonard Moeller is our guest on today's Prophecy in the News, the man who put a, an underwater camera down in the Gulf of Aqaba and found chariot wheels at the bottom of the sea. I uh, want to ask you about Yom Suf. We're not through with that. Try to explain why uh, you believe this is the crossing site. Uh, um, I, I'm pretty well sure you're convinced personally that it is the crossing site. Mm -hmm. Yes. First, I want to give a short comment about the name. And one could ask the question, is New York a Viking settlement? I mean, if we trace the name backwards, yes. Yes. it was a Swedish Viking that had a settlement in Britain. His name was Jar, and he had his settlement at the bay, and that is Vik in Swedish. Consequently, he called his settlement Jarvik. That became York in Britain, and that became New York in the US. Mm -hmm. So then the question is, is New York a Viking settlement? Of course it's not. but. If you trace the name backwards, you could speculate over that New York is a Viking settlement. Yes. And if we then take the Red Sea and talk about the Red Sea, is the Red Sea the Gulf of Aqaba? Is the Red Sea located in the Middle East? Is the Red Sea whatever? And then you have to go into the Hebrew name, which is Yam Suf. And that is not the Red Sea. And if we go backwards, we have a Latin translation of um, the Bible, uh, around 300 uh, AD, and there is called Mare Rubrum. Mare means sea, and Rubrum means red. Okay, you have the Red Sea. And then you go backwards to Septuagint, the Greek translation, and there is called the Red Sea. And the knowledge during that time about locations was extremely limited, extremely limited especially the people that were working with these translations. So you have to go back another step to Yam Suf and skip everything with the Red Sea. Sea of Reeds, or whatever we call it, it's not relevant. It's only one thing that is relevant, and that is that the crossing site is called Yam Suf. And then the question is, where in the Bible, where in the scripture do we find explanations or comments on Yam Suf? That's the only thing we have to deal with. Gary, give us a little idea on the etymology of the term Yam Suf. Well, Yam Suf, uh, J.R., Hebrew, Yam is the sea. Suf is, is a very difficult uh, root, uh, Dr. Muller, that is, uh, it's uncertain. But it can mean something like an enclosure or a surrounding, mm. uh, uh, like an enclosed place, an enclosed sea uh, mm. might be one of the meanings. Uh, Suf also has the meaning of red in, in, a, in a remote translation. But uh, <clears throat> there you have this mystery sea. So where is it, uh, Yom Suf? Yeah. And that's a very re relevant question. And uh, I went through here and I made a note actually. There are 35 places in the Old Testament, in different books of the Old Testament, that discusses Yom Suf. Mm -hmm. And to begin with, um, a number of these places, they talk about a very big sea, strong forces, big waves, etc. Nothing you would find in a small lake. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. A yes. number of uh, places talk about that. But maybe one, uh, one verse is the most important, and that is that King Solomon, he had his fleet at Yam Suf ah. in Eshon Geber and Eilat giving reference points, and we know that Eilat and Eshon Geber is somewhere in the northern part of the Gulf of Aqaba. And at that place, you know that that is Yam Suf. Uh, the other thing is that when some of the biblical texts discuss the borders of Israel, they have Yam Suf as one border point. And no one will put or have put a border point of uh, Israel somewhere in Egypt. And so what you have then is a geographic way to track down the location of Yom Suf, this mystery sea. 
And, and Solomon's ships actually departed here in the neighborhood of Etzion Geber, which is a place we know well. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, so it becomes possible to track down the location of the sea. Now, the sea also borders along Midian. Yes. The land of uh, where Moses spent 40 mm -hmm. years. But just one more comment on this. When people suggest lakes as being Yamsuf, mm -hmm. lakes in Egypt, yes. well, then one must ask a few questions. First, would King Solomon had his, <laughs> has his fleet in an Egyptian lake? Not really. Where we know that the ships were going to Tarshish and other places and yeah. Ophir, right. far away, mm. yes. bringing back gold and other things to, to Israel. Uh, it's like saying that the British fleet is located in the Great Lakes of the U.S. I mean, <laughs> it would be very, very stupid by the British to put their fleet there. Yes, indeed. <laughs> so that is not, I mean, if one state that Yamsuf is a lake in Egypt, you have to say that a lot of things in Scripture is not relevant, or you have just to forget them or don't look into them. Now, as I think you can see, uh, Dr. Moeller takes a very mm, analytical approach. Being a scientist, he, he's very logical. A and as we track down the location of this sea, and then uh, I think we can backtrack to the Exodus itself, for the people marched across uh, some desert. And so we're faced with the same problem we were with Yom Suf. If they, if, they, if they crossed some desert, where did they cross? Yeah. yeah it's, and you answer that question, by the way. <laughs> now, I've got to ask you about your experience there. I know it must have been an exhilarating time. Mm -hmm. Tell us about uh, the currents, the water, the depth, mm -hmm. uh, um, the divers. Mm -hmm. What are some of the things you experienced there that uh, really caught your attention? First, I've been there many times now. Mm -hmm. It's been very many times. My passport is filled with these stamps all over. Uh, the thing is that when we are in the Gulf of Aqaba diving, there are shark-infested waters, politically infested waters, so to speak. Mm. Uh, we have very strong currents. We have no surface support, no vessels in most cases at all. And um, we are guarded by policemen sitting on the beach we have the Coast Guard circulating around us. Sometimes we get a help from Bedouins that have a small, tiny little boat. And then they have to pay a fine because they helped us. And um, a normal situation is that you are dressed like a Christmas tree with all the equipment you can think of. As cameras, a diver. As a diver mm -hmm. with cameras. And you have so many things with you, markers and everything. Then you have to surface swim half a mile or one mile out in these waters. You have to go down to the seabed, and you can spend there, say, let's say, 10 or 15 minutes, and then you have to go up because there are deep waters, and then you have to swim all the way back. And you can do this a maximum two times per day. It's extremely tiresome. And to surface swim with all equipment, that's terrible to do. And then sometimes when I ask, well, why didn't you pick up things? And first, you're not allowed to pick up things. Secondly, how could you pick up a heavy object and just lift it up and swim up to the surface? Yes. I mean, take a stone or a piece of rock on the seabed and dive down and grab it, and you will end up there on the seabed. Mm. And yes. speaking of heavy objects, I want to just interject this. Uh, you all, if you've seen the book, if you've seen the videos, you've seen those wheels down there. And I asked uh, Dr. Muller, how do you know those are wheels? Uh, they look just like circular encrustations of coral. And he told us an interesting story. You actually saw a wheel that didn't have a coral encrustation. Yeah, the, you see, when writing a book like this, you try to focus on things that you can more clearly state that this is yes. what we found, or we documented this or so. But there is a lot of things that we haven't documented. We haven't been able to document. Mm -hmm. And one occasion was we were a number of divers down. Uh, and uh, I had to go up to the surface because my diving time was out. I didn't have uh, air left in the tubes or in the tank. And uh, two of the divers were still at the seabed. And uh, I didn't understand what he was doing. And then I went into the water again going down, let's say, 15 feet, going around in circles above their bubbles, because I just couldn't understand what are they doing down there so long time. And suddenly they came up from these very deep waters like rockets. And to cut a long story short, they found uh, something uh, that looked like and was a bronze wheel, a very heavy item, 
and they tried to grab it, and they got very interested in it. It was not covered by coral because it had been just under the, the layer of uh, sand or Ooh. silt. And they tried to grab it, and they were there, and they get so, got so excited about it, so they ran out of air. And it was a very critical situation. Oh, what a fantastic story, and one of many. Well, we're, we're out of time, mm -hmm. wouldn't you know? Yeah. JR, we, we've got to uh, bow out for this segment. Leonard Morris, yes. what a fascinating man. And uh, we'll also continue our interview on our next program next week. We'll be back in just a moment. I'm holding here my personal copy of The Exodus Case by Dr. Leonard Muller. This is a valued book. I treasure it, uh, along with uh, some of the most exciting books I've ever read, and it's right up there at the top. Dr. Muller is uh, a lecturer. He's a medical doctor at the Karolinska Institute of Stockholm, Sweden. Very prestigious position. More than that, he's a Bible-believing Christian who went on an archaeological expedition, actually a series of them, uh, to document the events of the Exodus. Who was the Pharaoh of the Exodus? Uh, what was the track across the desert to the Red Sea crossing? Where did they cross? And after they got there, where was the land of Midian, the mountain of God? What can be found there? Well, actually, you'll see pictures of rock carvings at the base of the mountain of God, an altar that was built by the children of Israel. So much evidence in pictures, 317 pages, almost 600 four-color pictures in this book. You call 1-800-883-1809 to get your copy, and JR, they'll love it, I'm sure. Yes, they will. It's $34.95 for the book. But Dr. Muller has also produced a companion video called The Exodus Revealed. And they put an underwater camera down at the bottom of the Red Sea and took pictures of the wreckage across the eight mile crossing site. Uh, dozens of chariot wheels, some still on the axles. It's an absolute must for you to see. It's 1995 and it's available on VHS but also on DVD for $24.95. The DVD has extra footage, including Cecil B. DeMille telling how he made and why he made the Ten Commandments. If you'll get the book for $34.95 and one of the videos, your choice of either the VHS or the DVD, we'll send you an extra bonus as well. Gary? And that bonus is Prophecy in the News, 12 issues, an annual subscription, uh, regularly valued at $29.95, yours absolutely free. Uh, when you order this very, very exciting offer that we have for you. Believe me, you're going to be showing your friends uh, the Exodus case. You'll be inviting them over to look at those videos, and they will be uh, awe-stricken, I promise you. Uh, but most of all, we want you to have a copy of this book, The Exodus Case, uh, in my opinion, a landmark production. Dr. Muller has done something very special here. And by the way, he told us that he did this as much as anything for the skeptic, for the individual who maybe has a little trouble believing the narratives of the Bible. Here are the facts carefully documented with hundreds of pictures. The Exodus case. Just call the 800 number on your screen right now, 1-800-883-1809, and we will rush this book to your home. We have introduced you to Leonard Muller, the author of this book. The Exodus Case. It's an absolutely fascinating study in the uh, Red Sea or Gulf of Aqaba, Yam Suf as it is called, and the chariot wheels at the bottom of the Red Sea. He also has the video. We've told you about that. And it's also available on DVD. Thanks for being with us on today's Prophecy in the News. Mm -hmm. Gary, yes. our next program is going to go deeper into this subject much deeper into the subject. And by the way, Dr. Muller takes a very methodical, uh, very scientific approach to analyzing the Old Testament. And that's very, very important. So you'll want to be tuned next time. I want to mention to you, if you'd like to have a sample copy of our magazine, we publish it each month, full color magazine. We invite you to call the number at the bottom of your screen and ask for it. This is J.R. Church and Gary Stearman. Until next time, keep looking at it. Prophecy in the News is a viewer-supported ministry sponsored by our many friends across America and in your area. For your gift of $10, you can receive a special edition of our current program on audio tape, or for a gift of $20, we'll send you our programs on videotape. For either order, call the 800 number on your screen. 
right now.